Mr. Royce for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me ask this, Chairman Powell. Uh, housing finance reform remains the great undone work of the financial crisis. And you have previously called for reform stating that we need to move to a system that attracts ample amounts of private capital to, to stand between housing sector credit risk and the taxpayers. A nationalized mortgage market is an unsustainable status quo, obviously, from a moral hazard perspective on this thing. And sadly, the situation we find ourselves in today was a predictable one. In 2003, I introduced legislation, and again in 2005, which would have reigned in the GSEs, allowing them to be regulated at that time for systemic risk. Then Fed Chairman Greenspan backed the amendment, but it was not enough to overcome the outsized political pressure brought by the GSEs themselves. To be fair, you said last summer that this was not a normal issue on which the, F the Fed would comment, but that we are in a now or never moment for reform, as there is not a current risk with a healthy economy now and, and the housing system. How long will this now or never moment last, and what are the consequences of inaction on this? I think now continues to be a good time to move forward on this. It is the, one of the big pieces of uh, unfinished business from the crisis. It is unsustainable to have the, effectively the, the U.S. housing finance system on the government's books uh, for the long run, and it's not, it's not healthy. So, um, I, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know how much long. I think it, 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 we're going to need to address this. I assume we will at some point, and I would just say the sooner the better. Let me ask you another question on this front. Chairman Greenspan often commented on the role of the GSEs in our economy. In 2004, in testimony before the Senate, he said, concerns about systemic risk are appropriately focused on large, highly leveraged financial institutions, such as the GSEs, to fend off possible future systemic difficulties, which we assess as likely if the GSE expansion continues unabated Preventative actions are required sooner rather than later. Those were his words in 04, ominous words, no doubt. Today, pressure is being brought on the administration to release the GSEs out of conservatorship. Although I oppose this move absent congressional action, I am hopeful that if this were to occur, there is no doubt today that Fannie and Freddie, given their size and role in the housing market, would be regulated as systemically important. Do you share this view? I, I, so the, the form in which this reform takes place will, of course, be up to you, not to us, and it's not in our lane. I would say I would really hope that, um, that these institutions would not be systemically important. Uh, at some point, I would think when we get to the when, when you figure out a process that uh, uh, where they can be moved off the balance sheet, the idea would be that they would not present systemic risk. Ideally, let me move to another question, Chairman Powell. Earlier this year, this committee passed legislation that would reverse a previous SEC rule requiring that certain money market funds float the the NAV. I certainly remember when the Federal Reserve Fund broke the buck in 2008. I remember where I was when that occurred. And the massive back, uh, backstop the U.S. taxpayers provided to restart the entire market as, as a result of, uh, of this and other factors. The fact is that the value of the underlying assets of those pro, uh, products fluctuate. They go up and down. As I said in, in opposition to the bill at the time, if we learned anything from the financial crisis, it should be that the price should reflect risk. While understanding this is the primary jurisdiction of the SEC, and Chairman Clayton has already expressed his concerns, I was hoping as a member of the FSOC and as someone uniquely positioned to comment on macro financial stability that you could comment on any concerns with this potential move. I, I very much share your concerns. This was, this was one of the many critical uh, weaknesses identified in our financial system during the crisis. 
we worked hard to, to address it, I think, successfully to some extent, and I'd, I'd not like to see that uh, undone. Chairman Powell, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, chair Powell, uh, the last time that you were here, I discussed with you a policy of countervailing currency purchases uh, as a response when a country has been determined to be a currency manipulator. I believe that my staff has, has transferred to your staff the, the ideas from the Peterson Institute on, um, on the specifics of how countervailing currency intervention may be an appropriate response. Um, uh, uh, but I'm actually more concerned now about uh, the currency manipulation than I have been. Uh, you know, obviously President Trump has uh, sort of recklessly uh, now begun a trade war uh, with, uh, with many of our trading partners. Uh, particularly with China. Uh, I think many of the countries that are on their currency manipulation watch list that gets reported every so often by Treasury have been either hit or threatened by tariffs. Uh, some of these countries are going to run out of gas in terms of the, the products that they can uh, impose counter retaliatory tariffs on, at which point I think it is quite likely that they will resume currency manipulation that they've <clears> done in the past. Um, and China is probably top of my list on this uh, because they have, uh, they will run out of gas fairly quickly. Um, and the damage that has been done in the past by, by Chinese currency manipulation is enormous and one that, uh, you know, many of my constituents have felt in, in their businesses. Um, and so I think it is more pressing than now that we actually have a, a response in place, ready to go, uh, if and when any one of those countries, in particular China, resumes currency manipulation. Uh, countervailing currency manipulation is something that can be done. I think it's an appropriate response, and it can be done. Um, and so I was wondering, has Treasury contacted you in any way uh, with our suggestions uh, that we've given to them on, on getting ready, having this take place? Because obviously a significant response would be a joint project between Treasury and, and well, the Federal Reserve. It is entirely, the, the, the currency issues are entirely up to Treasury. I, I don't know whether they've te technically consulted with us about it or not. It's the first time hearing about it. Okay. Um, well, yeah, anyway, so I encourage you to, to look into this. Um, uh, you know, if you find that there's any legislative impediments to that, the, um, I believe the suggestion from the Peterson Institute is that if this goes forward, it would be a joint effort uh, where the, the currency purchases would be jointly done by Treasury and the Fed. So it we would, would be, just be implementing their decisions, though. We're, we wouldn't correct. be making those decisions. Uh, you, correct. But it's, it's something that I, I hope that we are prepared for because the risk, if anything, of a, of a resumption of significant currency manipulation has certainly gone up because of the, the, the Republican uh, tariffs. Um, and so, so okay, so I, I just want to flag that for you. Uh, secondly, um, you know, there's been some discussion in the previous testimony about uh, wage growth and so on, and th this plot that's up here, um, did you see the article in the Wall Street Journal a couple days ago about how inflation is eating up wor workers' wage increases? Yeah, and this is essentially the plot from that, that shows that, um, that while, uh, while <laughs> workers' wages were out during the, the Obama era, workers' wages were modestly, uh, you know, outstripping inflation, that's no longer true in the Trump era that uh, things like the massive tax cut for the wealthy um, and the deficit spending have driven, have driven inflation more than they have driven wages. As a result, for wage earners, the situation you know, has not improved. Uh, that's in, in great contrast to the, um, uh, to the situation for um, you know, CEOs and so on who've seen their compensation go up way faster than inflation. Um, and so, uh, so I was... You know, there was a, an announcement by the Federal Reserve, uh, I guess a month or so ago, that you know, the historic milestone of household net worth uh, exceeding $100 trillion, which I think is a very, you know, it was a very interesting milestone in the recovery. It's up from, I believe, around 55 or $60 trillion uh, during the depths of the crisis. And so it's a, it's a real milestone. Uh, but that is an aggregate number. And so one, one of the things we're seeing more and more is a divergence between average numbers when you average in the results of the very wealthy with numbers like this, which is the, the, the wages for wage earners, where the situation is very different. So what I was, would like to urge you to do is when you report, uh, for example, household net worth, to report it not only as an aggregate, but as, as quintiles or the top 1%, top 10%, 
and to report this on a quarterly basis the same way you report the aggregate number. I think it would really illuminate a lot of where our economy is going. And I'd like to see that in uh, the next report and future reports, if, if that's possible. I'll look into that. All right. Well, thanks much. Thank you. I... Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, chairman of our Terrorism and Illicit Finance Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, appreciate uh, you being here today and your leadership on the economic uh, front for the country. So you had, had given testimony uh, yesterday or, or whenever to the Senate about the effect of opioids and the labor force participation rate. Can you kind of walk through that briefly for me? Yes. Um, well, uh, labor force participation by prime age males has been declining for 60 years. Uh, it's been declining for females uh, for maybe the last 15, 20 years in the United States. We stand, we stand out compared to other countries. So many things that happen in the economy are global. This is really something that we have. Um, uh, a significant number of, of those in their prime working years who are not in the labor force, close to half, I think in that one, one estimate was 44%, are taking painkillers of some kind, which is the opioid crisis to some extent. So there are many, many people who are out there in their prime working years, not in the labor force. We'd all be better off if they were in the labor force, including them. And part of the reason they're not is that is, is the drug issue. The, the problem is, is especially egregious in, in uh, much of New Mexico, and so we've passed a series of bills here that are, are directed at, at beginning to stem that, that problem. Have you looked much at the, at the legislation that we've uh, passed through the House, anything that stands out as being especially effective uh, in, in your ideas or the ideas of the committee? You know, I haven't looked at it carefully. I did see that, but uh, I, I, I'll be happy to go back and, and okay. look. Okay, yeah. Now, for, for New Mexico, we have a little bit of an aging population, and, and we also have a lower income population. Uh, that all argues for uh, less complexity in, in the investments. And so typically, they would like safe investments, but then the, the interest rate is always at such a low rate that it's driving unsophisticated investors into sophisticated items seeking rates of return. Any ideas how we can, can help out our seniors who typically fall into that category? I'm thinking about my mom the last few years of her life. Uh, she, just, she just wanted not to lose money and just to have it safe. And, and uh, yet we're seeing a lot of seniors chasing, chasing rates of return and, and getting into very unsafe things. Then they lose their nest egg. So what, how's, how's the, the reserve looking at that? You know, we're, as you know, we're not uh, responsible for- If you could speak a little bit more in, directly into the microphone, I'd appreciate it. Sorry, we're, we're, not, um, we're not responsible for investor protection, but we kind of are responsible- No, it's the rate of return. Rates. It's the rate of return on simple investments, the rate of return on passbook savings or, or money markets. That's the question. Right. Um, we, uh, we've kept rates low for a long time, and we think that's had a very positive effect on the economy. It's boosted employment, it's boosted activity. Um, I think for, for, it's definitely been tough for seniors who, have, have, uh, who are really relying on their passbook savings, for example, for interest. Uh, but overall, for the economy, it's, it's been a good thing. And, you know, rates are going up now uh, because to reflect the strength of the economy. So uh, that should be helping some. Yeah. Uh, as we talk about the labor force participation rate, uh, we're also noting a lot of skill atrophy, uh, people who've been... Uh, on different public assistance programs for some time uh, actually don't have much skills. So as, as the president talks, he talks about the apprenticeship programs. Have you all uh, taken a close look at, at how the apprenticeship programs could be directed at the people who've been out of the labor force, not, in the, not the people in the high schools, but the people who have been uh, on the sidelines for some time? Are, are there any studies available to us on on the effectiveness of those programs? Yes, we, we have um, an excellent group of labor economists and, uh, and that has been a particular focus, I know. So we, we would be delighted to uh, supply that to you, discuss it with you or your staff. We'd be happy to work with you on that. 
the the energy economy that you reference in your report a couple of times uh, is is one that's playing out in the southeast part of New Mexico, uh, some of the largest well the largest finds uh, and and most productive wells being drilled are occurring right there. Uh, the pipeline capacity is becoming a choke point, and then also the refining capabilities. So we're suggesting building a refinery in New Mexico and asking for White House help to get the permits done. Uh, all of that would, would help us to become energy self-sufficient. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member, and thank you, Chairman Powell. Good to see you again. Uh, I just have a couple quick questions I'm going to try to get through. Mr. Chairman, uh, I brought the Federal Reserve supervision and examination of insurance savings and loan holding companies up previously with Federal Reserve Governor Quarles, and my staff brought this topic up with the Fed staff on several occasions. Since the economic crisis, a number of insurance and saving and loans holding companies has dwindled from some 30 to just 11, according to the Fed's 2017 annual report. I have two of these insurance companies in my district, <coughs> which employ thousands of people, and one of them just announced that they are closing their depository institution. While I understand that there are several business reasons for an insurance savings and loan holding company to close their own depository institution, there is little doubt that one of the factors why they are closing them down is due to the burdensome and inefficient supervisory regime by the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve. I have worked with my colleague on the other side of the aisle, Mr. Rothfuss, to introduce legislation that would force the Federal Reserve to tailor their bank-centric regulations to those to insurance companies, which are wholly, as you know, different from banks. While I think there should be some cost of admission for an insurance company to own a depository institution, I don't think that cost should be so high that it makes no financial sense to own one, which is where I think that we're headed. Do you think that this problem that these insurance companies are closing their banks that this is part of the reason, or is it the Federal Reserve's desire for no insurance companies to own a depository institution? It's certainly not our desire to drive anybody out uh, of owning a bank who can legally own a bank. Uh, I think in the case of depository institutions that are owned by insurance companies, our interest is in, in the safety and soundness of that depository institution. So we work very carefully not to duplicate the insurance regulatory work that the state insurance supervisors capably do. But we have, we have a role to play as the holding company supervisor as it relates to the depository institution. And that's what we care about. That's really all we care about. And I think, um, you know, my, my recollection, these, these companies are getting out of owning depository institutions mostly for business reasons as opposed to for regulatory reasons. In any case, we're committed to doing that as efficiently as we can, and um, are you familiar with our legislation? Is yes, it I something am. that will be helpful, or do you well, have an opinion? We, so we've, ra we've raised concerns. When the, the concern that we've raised is that we would be effectively out of the business of supervision at the holding company. We would we would promulgate standards, but they would be supervised by, by the, the insurance supervisor. And the insur insurance supervisors they do a fine job of in supervising insurance, but they're not prudential regulators of banks. And we don't, we don't think, if, we think if you're going to own a bank, you should be subject to regulation by a prudential regulator of banks, which would be us in this case. But you'd be at least willing to kind of see if we could tweak it or work together? Absolutely. Maybe. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, on another good note, let me also uh, say uh, thank you for being very responsive to our letters to you from the Congressional Black Caucus and for me on diversity. Uh, I really appreciate that. As you'll probably recall, we've had several conversations about the Beatty rule that's patterned after the Rooney rule. If you're looking for minorities and more specifically African Americans to serve on the Federal Reserve, then you have to put them on the list. You have to uh, include them in the room. So while we weren't necessarily overjoyed with the last appointment, I am pleased that Mr. Bostic uh, is there and just hoping as more openings come that you'll keep that in the back of your mind. Lastly, I have kind of an odd question. Uh, I was on my way back to Washington. Uh, I stopped in a restaurant and a gentleman came up to me and chased me down and said, I know that uh, Mr. Powell's gonna be coming before your committee, which you asked him this question. 
Well, we're going to kind of paraphrase it because my team wasn't quite sure <laughs> what he was asking, and he stated it more as a fact. But I, I think what the constituent uh, was asking me, uh, and he stated it more as a fact than a question, but he simply essentially wanted me to ask you whether or not you believe the Federal Reserve's monetary policies is exacerbates the wealth inequality in our country. I think for some reason he felt that organizations who receive the interest payments on our national de debt is destroying the middle class. We, no, we don't think monetary policy is exacerbating inequality. We think, in fact, it's helping uh, those who, who didn't have jobs get jobs. And so those are the people who, are, who need those jobs. Thank you very much. And I Time yield. of the gentlelady has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Chairman. And Chairman Powell, thank you for being here. Your uh, predecessor, from whom I had a great deal of respect, I know struggled for some time with regard to the um, impact of the quantitative easing, the low interest rates, the high unemployment. And I see that, based on your report today, uh, the outlook is much brighter and doing much better. I echo my concerns of uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Pierce, because I have a great deal of retirees in my community, and they want to start seeing some return on their investment, of course, instead of having to keep uh, dipping into the, the principal of, of their savings. Um, Chairman Powell, it's been more than nine months since the Federal Reserve had its first official vice chair for supervision sworn in. Uh, as you know, prior to Vice Chair Quarles taking office, the responsibilities of his position were unofficially shared between former Fed officials to such an extent that it was never really sure who was in charge of regulatory affairs at the Federal Reserve. Uh, as a consequence, it felt, uh, it felt to many of us in Congress that the divide between the Federal Reserve's regulatory responsibilities and those related to monetary policy wasn't as explicit as it should have been. Further, there seemed to be a high risk that Federal Reserve regulations were not being given the necessary oversight and evaluations. There were more and more regulations coming out. Um, and now with the, the position filled by Vice, President, Vice Chair Quarles, I'd like to hear if things have changed the Federal Reserve. Do you find that having a Vice Chair for Supervision has allowed you to focus, focus more on monetary policy um, uh, uh, the side of the Federal Reserve's work. In other words, does it help prevent inappropriate overlap of the Fed's roles? Um, now that you've got distinguished uh, supervisory roles in, in the Fed. Yeah. Um, let me say it's, um, it's great to have uh, Vice Chair Quarles in his role, and I know he was confirmed yesterday into his underlying governor term. It's terrific. I worked with him, I, I worked with him 25 years ago, I, I, so he's, uh, he's been great. Um, we think of the roles as pretty complementary, actually. We think that, we think that um, essentially the financial system more broadly and the banking system is the transmission channel for monetary policy. So we think we learn a lot about, about what's going on in the economy and also about how monetary policy is getting out into the economy by virtue of the fact that we're in supervision. Um, we do have a separate division that takes, that takes care of all that. and. Uh, Vice Chair Quarles, as the Vice Chair, has particular authorities under the statute to recommend policies to the board, that sort of thing. I and, hope I'm getting to your question. Yeah, and, but, but as I mentioned, I think, uh, you know, the past 10 years we've seen the financial, um, as a result of the financial crisis, we've seen new regulatory schemes um, being imposed. Um, and it seems to me that now would be an appropriate time for the regulators to take a step back and conduct, a, let's say, a holistic review of the impact of these regulations. And, and I believe that having Vice Chairman of Supervision renders this holistic view more appropriate at this time. I'm, I mean, do you think now would be a good time for such a, a review? It is a good time, and in fact, we're doing that. You know, we, we're committed to, to you know, sustaining the, the important post-crisis regulatory reforms, you know, higher capital, higher liquidity, stress testing resolution. We're also committed to looking at everything that we've done in the last 10 years and making sure that it's right-sized and effective. Have, has, have your, has your review revealed any duplicative or uh, burdensome regulations that could probably do, be done away with at this point? Yes, or? I think we're, we're finding quite a lot to do, mainly as it relates to smaller and medium-sized institutions, uh, which uh, we're, I, think, I think there's quite a lot of good work that we can do on that front. Uh, also part of your report, um, you note that residential investment has leveled off for the first five months of this year, and that, that's a little disappointing to me because I think that's a leading indicator for us in terms of the residential investment. 
When I go home to Central Florida, I can see skyrocketing demand for homes, uh, but for some reasons, ju developers just can't keep up. One of the things that you've talked about, and I think that Mr. Pierce talked about also, is the, quote, tight supply of skilled labor. Can you expand on that? I mean, how long have we been approaching this tight supply of skilled labor? M my concern is this, is that we have a great tailwind behind us right now. We've got a 4% GDP. We've got lower unemployment than we've had in a long time. We've got more capital than we've seen before. But yet, if we're not going to have the economic recovery because we don't have a labor market, what's in store for us? And how can we best address this labor market shortage that we that, that's, that's facing us? It's a real challenge. You know, you plumbers, carpenters, electricians uh, in short supply. A lot of people left the industry after the crash. Now there's a need. Also, it's very hard to get lots. I mean, it, it, it's difficult. The zoning and everything is quite difficult. The, the addition, training programs. They're, they're also facing, uh, you know, high materials prices, right? Uh, right. The, the big Which is a component of it, too. But even if we, we have to have the labor is what yeah. I'm getting at. And, and even if we have to import the labor, we need the skilled labor. So we, you know, you, you, I think you're right. The, the, there's a good question about how the economy will absorb all of this momentum, and, and uh, I, I think the, the, the tools to expand the labor force are really not ours, they're really yours. I agree. Thank you, I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Pittenger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for being with us. I really want to commend you for taking the initiative to provide uh, time to be with members and <clears throat> for allow those discussions to occur. I think it's very helpful for us. Mr. Chairman, as I understand it, it is your directive to promote stable prices. Some of your policy committee members have expressed interest in replacing the current inflation target with different target measures that would provide even greater variability. Uh, given that, would you help me just better understand the difference between price stability and stable prices? I think they mean the same thing. I wouldn't say there's a big difference there. Good. Well, thank you. That, that clarification helps. <laughs> uh, in this year's monetary policy report, you state that the labor force participation rate has been in decline for decades and has, been, and has seen a recent increase among prime age individuals. Despite the factors that continue to cause the decline persisting, you have said that the continuation of the increases seen over the past few years is possible if favorable labor market conditions continue as well. Have you seen these favorable uh, labor markets, at least more recently, remain or even show increases since the passing of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? We, we do see the labor market continuing to strengthen. And as you point out, uh, labor force participation by, by prime age males and females has kicked up in the last couple of years. That's a great thing to see. And you know, we really hope those gains are sustained against a, a longer run trend of decline. But we, we, hope, uh, we hope that this is a great chance for people to get back in the labor market and we hope stay there. Would you draw any correlation between the, the tax cut and Jobs Act bill and that dimension? You know, the, um, I think that the, 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 there are a variety of things contributing to this. Certainly the, um, uh, uh, the, the business tax cuts are, are, are helping support activity and, and the individual tax cuts too. How have the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, affected your current monetary policy? Sorry, I missed that. How, how has the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act affected your current monetary policy? You know, it's hard to single out an effect. We really look at many, many different things. Um, you know, the, the economy is strong and we're on a path of gradually rating, ra raising rates. And uh, I think that reflects kind of all of the things that are going on, including, the, including the, the changes in fiscal policy. Yes, sir. With the new tariffs coming from both at home and abroad, uh, some businesses are shying away from both capital and labor force investments. The report states that net exports had increased in the second quarter, led by agricultural exports. Do you see this changing, especially in light of the retaliatory tariffs on numerous agricultural products from Canada and the European Union? I'm sorry, the last Do you see this uh, uh, changing in light of the retaliatory tariffs coming from Canada and the European Union? Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about, about how this uh, round of discussions between us and essentially all of our major trading partners will come out. I think if it does wind up in a lot of reciprocal tariffs, then it would certainly uh, affect 
our exporting industries, including, in a big way, U.S. agriculture. So it's a risk. Yes, sir. You previously stated that the U.S. financial system is substantially more resilient than the decade before the financial crisis. Should then, uh, should there be a trade war, what tools do you have to move quickly to ensure this continued resiliency and economic growth? I think the, uh, the financial system is, is well capitalized and, and so much more strong and resilient in so many ways that, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's there in a, in a position so that it can resist or be resilient against shocks of various kinds, and that would include changes to trade policy that became disruptive. I think our, you know, our monetary policy tool we can always use to, uh, you know, it really relates to demand. So if demand weakens, then we can support demand. I mean, the, the, the issue, the harder issue is uh, uh, you could be seeing higher prices because of tariffs. At, at the same time, you're seeing, uh, you know, lower economic activity, and potentially that would imply higher inflation. A mere increase in tariffs wouldn't, wouldn't mean necessarily higher future inflation, but if it, if it did have that implication, it could, it could be very challenging for policy. Thank you. My time has expired. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Chairman. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the automatic SIFI uh, designation being set at $250 billion in S2155. This was an important change that right-sized the regulatory burden for a significant number of small and medium-sized institutions. In setting the threshold at $250 billion, however, we grouped large regional banks together with banks that have assets in excess of a trillion dollars. These institutions do not only differ from each other in terms of size, they also differ in their levels of risk and complexity, as well as their capital structure and their business mix. Would you agree with that assessment that there is a distinction between those large regional banks and, and those other banks? Very much so, not just size, activities as well. Given this distinction, how will the Fed be tailoring regulations for banks above the $250 billion threshold? Working on a framework now, um, some ways away from publishing it, but it'll, it'll take, an, take into account a range of factors, including size will be one, but also many others, such as complexity, interconnectedness, the nature of their activities, all, all those. We'll take in a, a, a wide range of factors. The bill gives us a great deal of flexibility to identify the appropriate factors, and we're just in the process of doing that. We're going to put that out for comment and listen carefully to public reaction to any time frame yet it. and when that might happen, comment period? I can't be precise. Well, i just tell you, we're working hard on it right now. Okay. Uh, when Secretary Mnuchin testified before this committee, I asked him about an issue that many of us on this committee have expressed concerns about, non-bank SIFI designations. I've advocated for an activities-based approach to addressing systemic risk. I was pleased to hear that Secretary Mnuchin also supported adopting this approach and that the FSOC was moving in that direction. Do you support an activities-based approach? Yes, I think that makes sense. Uh, what would be the status of FSOC's implementation of that approach? Um, really a question for the Secretary, but uh, I, th I think that's, that's, that's more how we're looking at things these days, is, is looking at activities, as well as we can always look at institutions when, when it's appropriate, but for now we're looking at a lot of activities. If I could talk a little bit about the yield curve. Uh, the inversion of the yield curve is typically viewed as a sign of a coming recession. Mm -hmm. The yield curve is currently flattening, and this has attracted a lot of attention. In a recent post, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari wrote, uh, quote, this suggests that there is little reason to raise rates much further, invert the yield curve, and put the brakes on the economy, and risk that it does, in fact, trigger a recession. Do you agree with this view? I don't see any evidence that uh, a recession is, uh, is imminent. We're not forecasting a recession, um, and so uh, I don't really think we, we see a recession coming. Do you have an opinion um, on how strong of a signal the yield curve inversion is? Um, so the, the inversion of the yield curve, curve uh, has been, just as an empirical matter, it's been associated with downturns in the past, but I, I would just say the real, the real point, I think, is a yield curve inverts. We, we know why short-term rates go up, because basically they're looking at the, at the Fed's expected rate path. The real question is what's going on with longer term rates, and if you back out the term premium and look at that, then it's really, a, it's really an assessment in the market of what the neutral longer term rate is, what it will be. So if, if, if in fact 
monetary policy is higher than that, then that, that means that policy is tight. You're actually tightening policy. So that, the, the yield curve is simply a, a way to identify what is really the important thing, which is where is current policy and where is expected policy relative to neutral. So I, I prefer to look directly at, at the question at, at hand, and you think about the, the yield curve as, as giving you evidence on that. So the yield curve is not inverted now. Um, it's, still, it's still at a positive slope, and it's something you know, that we'll, we'll, we'll watch. All of, it, all of us have a little di different ways of thinking about it. That's how I think about it. It's something we're looking at carefully. Great. Thank you. Uh, when you last testified uh, before this committee, we discussed the importance of monetary policy independence and potential risks to that independence posed by both our national debt and the Fed's outsized balance sheet. Would swapping mortgage-backed securities holdings for treasuries help to mitigate some of the political risks that follow from monetary policies becoming credit policies? I, I don't see our MBS holdings as, you know, we're, they're dwindling over time now. They're in, uh, in normalization mode. I don't see them as presenting, uh, um, you know, uh, particularly salient uh, independence risk to us right now. Thank you, Chairman. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Poliquin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Thank you, Chair Powell, for being here. You've been here, sir, for almost three hours with a 10-minute break, and you look like you need a vacation. I want to remind you that Maine that I represent is vacation <laughs> land. Uh, you don't even need air conditioning up there, and I'm sure you and your family would enjoy it. If you want to go up there, just give us a call. We'll take, send you in the right direction. Sir, um, the past couple of years, the economy's been getting stronger and stronger, and you mentioned in your testimony that the uh, national unemployment rate has been about the lowest it's been in 20 years. Up in Maine, we have also good news. The unemployment rate is roughly 2.8 percent. It's been the lowest in about 50 years, and folks are making more money, and uh, they're able to change jobs if they don't like the one they have. And, and some of our young workers are able to come back to the state, whereas in the past, they haven't been able to. And our confidence with our consumers and our small businesses is all very strong. Now, if you look at the prior seven to eight years, the exact opposite was going on. Unemployment rates were very high, confidence was low, <clears throat> taxes and regulations were high, and, um, and we had a real, a real problem everywhere. Now, my, my point to you, sir, and if you would agree with me, that this strong economy we have now is not by accident. It didn't fall out of the sky. There's something that had to be done to correct this. Would you agree with me that making it easier for businesses to grow and hire more people and pay them more, uh, through uh, lower taxes and fewer regulations, a more predictable regulatory environment has helped the economy? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would just say in principle that regulation should be balanced sure. and should be fair and that that will support. You yeah, anybody that's run a business, and, uh, and I come from that part of the world, sir, you know, would agree with that, and I appreciate it. I know you don't want to dig into policy uh, that we do here, and I understand that. One of my concerns, my major concern, Mr. Paul, is how do we keep this going? How do we keep this going for our families in Maine and elsewhere? I look back at the last few recessions. In 2001, we had a bubble in the dot-com sector of the tech stocks, and that caused a, a recession. Uh, the terrorist attacks in 9-11 caused a mild recession. After that, that's an external event that you know, we can't control here anyway. And then in the 2008 to 12 Great Recession, again, a real estate bubble, in part brought on by financial instruments that dealt with the real estate market brought that on. So I think we can both conclude that what happens in the capital markets, what happens in the financial sector has a huge impact on what happens on Main Street when it comes to a growing economy or the other way around. Now, here's my concern, Mr. Paul, and I'd love to have your response to this. During the past 10 years, for most of the past 10 years, interest rates have been very low, in some cases at zero unusually low, and that's caused a rising uh, uh, financial sector, whether it be the equity market or the fixed income market. So I'm looking and I'm saying, here we have the chair of the Fed before the Committee of Jurisdiction in the House. What advice can you give to Congress, mm -hmm. Mr. Powell, to make sure that we keep this strong economy going? What should we make sure we do not do? Well, let me say we strongly share your goal to keep this expansion going, and we think that uh, continuing to gradually raise rates for now is the right way to do that. Um, uh, as I think we discussed uh, when we were together, I, 
I, I think it's important to address things like we talked about earlier, things like labor force participation, things like education and training. Um, we need we need people. You know, we need more people who can fill these jobs that are going to be going to be coming open. And uh, I mean, my my concerns are are not so much um, are, are really about the, the supply side at this point. You know, we're we're close to we're close to full employment, maybe not quite there, but um, it's the issues like labor force participation and. Uh, job training and, and addressing the, you know, the people who are out of the labor force, get them back in. Do there are some folks that think we ought to raise taxes and go back to where we were before. Is that a good idea? I, you know, I just, I'm not going to give you advice on fiscal policy. Sorry. Okay. Um, the national debt, and pivoting a little bit, um, 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 Mr. Paul, is about $21 trillion. It is horrible. The interest on that debt now is approaching roughly $300 billion per year, which is about one and a half times what we spend to care for our 7 million veterans every year in this country. At what point do you think the debt service payments, the interest on that debt, becomes a problem for our economy? It's hard to identify a particular point. As I would just say, we've been on an unsustainable fiscal path for some time, and you know the theory is we should be addressing it when the economy is strong. Do you agree with me that a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution is a good idea to force Washington to spend within its means and start paying down our debt, sir? No, I do not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. My time. time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, sir. I thought I was going in a different direction. My apologies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's, a, again, a pleasure to have you here and have an opportunity to hear you and, and speak with you. For starters, I'd just like to make a brief comment about tailoring regulations. Uh, I mentioned the importance of taking a tailored approach to financial regulation when you appeared before our committee in February, but that was actually prior to the passage of the economic growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Eliminating the one-size-fits-all regulatory mindset for small community financial institutions is obvious, uh, obviously important. However, uh, S-2155 was explicit in its requirement that federal regulators shall tailor enhanced prudential standards for all financial institutions based on their risk instead of asset size. This is a very important issue, and I hope uh, that we can keep an open and constructive dialogue on this issue uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, again, it's the, for us, it's the issue of risk versus asset size. And I see you're nodding, so hopefully that means we are going to keep a constructive dialogue about we, how you approach We look forward it. to that. Uh, it, it, moving on, uh, Chairman Powell, your committee uh, initiated a balance sheet roll-off less than a year ago, October of 2017. During your, uh, shortly thereafter, during your confirmation hearing, you testified that balance sheet reductions would likely stay in place for, quote, about three or four years. Uh, I understand, however, that now some uh, FOMC members are already calling for an early end to what has been seem a seemingly slow balance sheet normalization schedule. Are you considering a premature end to your balance sheet roll-off program? Uh, no, but uh, l let's be clear. We don't, uh, we've always said that there's significant uncertainty about how long it will take. Ultimately, the balance sheet will be no larger than it needs to be for us to conduct monetary policy. It will consist primarily of Treasury securities, and its ultimate size in the long run will be driven by the market's demand and the people, the public's demand for our liabilities, principally currency and reserves. So we're learning, along with everybody else, as the balance sheet shrinks, as to what the new normal will be. And I have to say there, there's a significant amount of uncertainty. We'll learn a lot. Um, you know, the uh, markets are, are moving their estimates up, but I, I don't think we're going to know for some time exactly uh, what that equilibrium size will be. It'll be much bigger, though, than it was before the crisis, because the public wants more, currency is more, currency in circulation more than doubled since 2008, well more than doubled. And reserves have gone up substantially because they're a highly desirable liquid asset for banks. All right. But at this point, there's no plan to prematurely end the rollout. Certainly not prematurely, no. All right. Uh, the European Central Bank is reportedly convinced that the region's economy is strong enough to withdraw some of its crisis-era support. Our economy, by contrast, has been humming for more than a year. 
If the EU is lifting off from its unconventional stance, should we be slowing or stopping a return to fundamentals? Uh, and would doing so leave us stuck with a balance sheet that remains conflicted between monetary and macro prudential policy? You know, we're, we're much more significantly down the road in the normalization process. The European Central Bank is, has said that they would stop asset purchases, assuming certain conditions are met by the end of the year and would not begin to raise interest rates until at least um, the end of the summer of 2019. So they're some years behind our process. We've been raising interest rates since December of 2015. Right. Our balance sheet's been shrinking, as you pointed out, since last October. So, and I think our, you know, we're, we think our path is working very well. We, we, we think the, the gradual rate increases are, are right, just about right, and we think the balance sheet normalization process is, is working very smoothly. Has your committee devised a strategy for how and when to change the balance sheet roll-off schedule? I mean, I'm taking you down this because I, I understand your answer earlier is there's a lot of uncertainty as we, and we learn as we go, but what's, what's the strategy or is it just that general that we're just going to see how this goes and we're going to leave us, ourselves the flexibility to, to jump in and change things? We, we said can, we would continue the program as announced unless there were, I won't get the exact terms, but it will be, you know, it's really a significant economic downturn requiring a meaningful reduction in inter interest rates. Words close to, but not exactly that. I don't know if you'll have time, but I do want to ask this. Uh, do you think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that market participants have the transparency they need to make productive investments in our economy? And what data would persuade your committee to speed up, slow down, or even stop? A significant reduction, a significant um, downturn in the economy that required meaningful reduction in uh, in, um, in the interest rates. I think the markets understand it very well. Thank time, you. time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, sir, for being here. So, for over a year now, I've been helping to lead a task force, trying to understand why home prices and rents. Uh, mm -hmm well, frankly, are soaring all over the country. And it turns out the answer is pretty simple. We're not building enough housing units, period. Uh, I looked this morning, and as it turns out, new home starts are lower than when you started at Treasury under the first President Bush. Uh, and a lot of time has passed, and the population has grown considerably. Fewer home starts than way back then. So prices are rising because of simple... Uh, fact that we're missing millions of homes uh, and we have too many people bidding for too few homes. Uh, and we're trying to understand why construction isn't happening and what can be done about it. We feel pretty strongly about this because uh, home ownership is a, still an integral part of the American dream and frankly it's the number one source of retirement security for most Americans. But it also strike me, strikes me that it's pretty important to your work, mm -hmm. sir. Um, now, in my mind, I have kind of a simple model. When the economy goes bad, you all cut rates, and that means that more people buy more automobiles and more homes, and uh, the workers in those industries work longer hours and get more, way, uh, more uh, wages, and it creates a virtuous cycle of economic growth. But what happens if home construction doesn't or can't respond? Um, the weakness in housing in this last recovery was clearly a reason why it was at historic, some would say anemic, levels. Uh, and if home construction continues to be broken, and there's every bit of evidence that it is, I'm wondering what that means for the next recession and what your response can and should be. Does it mean you have to cut interest rates even more aggressively to get the economic response because it didn't seem to work out very well that way this time. So um, it, you're right, it's uh, those back in the day, it was nothing to see, well, it was common to see two million housing starts in a year and more. And we don't see that now. And part of that is just the population's growing a lot less, uh, a lot more slowly now, much, much slower than it was. So there's less, there's less demand. And I'm sure you talk to a lot of home builders and, and their representatives in, in your work and what they say now is there's really supply side constraints. They can't find electricians, plumbers, carpenters, and also they, it's hard to get zoning, it's hard to get lots, very, very difficult to do that. They're also, um, they're, they're yelling loudly about materials prices, lumber in particular. And so they're, that's what they're, so what they're doing is they're building fewer homes and the prices are going up more quickly. We don't really have the tools to deal with that. 
In terms of the importance of housing, though, the economy is so much bigger than it was before, and housing is smaller than it was before. So it's, it's a less important driver of, of economic activity at the aggregate level. It's still tremendously important for individuals. I mean, it is still part of the American dream and part of what, you know, uh, young families and, and folks want to have. So, um, but I, I don't think it has, um, it doesn't have, uh, it's not the single most important factor driving monetary policy right now. It's, I think these issues are really issues of, uh, you know, issues in, out in the labor market that we don't, we don't directly affect. So, would, would you agree, however, <clears throat> that by historic, but that historically, uh, housing construction has been a much more important, played a much more important role in economic recovery. It was a far bigger part of the economy, and it was also, it is, can be very cyclical. So yes, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, it was, you know, sort of first in, first out, first in the recession, and, first out. And before, during recoveries, um, and if you do the math on what the increase in uh, GDP growth would be if we simply had a housing market that was in balance, then it, it wouldn't be too hard to calculate a material increase in GDP growth. Would you agree with that? It would be bigger. I mean, if, if, how, if, if the housing market, if housing starts were 50 percent higher or something, yeah, that would be meaningful for sure. So some of what you said, uh, not only do I agree with, but our study concludes as well, which is that these other inputs, uh, land, labor, lending, lumber, or materials, uh, are the key drivers here. Uh, but the takeaway I have from you today is that those inputs and whatever limitations and challenges that they are presenting that is holding back housing construction uh, may in fact be immune to interest rate reduction, and so we better get to work on those factors. Well said. Thank you, sir. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Holgren. Thank you, Chairman Hensling. Uh, chair Powell, welcome. Uh, glad you're here. I'd echo much of what my colleagues have said on both sides of the aisle of our gratitude for your openness and willingness to meet with us uh, and to hear from us. And uh, that's so affirming. So thank you very much and appreciate your work. I, I have shared some uh, very specific concerns with you about how our current risk-based and leverage-based capital rules are damaging to liquidity in the listed options markets. As you know, Title VII of Dodd-Frank requires central clearing for derivatives, and in case of options, this service is generally provided by bank clearing members. The Financial Services Committee reported a bill with unanimous support, which recently passed the House, uh, directing bank regulators to adjust the capital rules. However, as I understand it, no change in law is necessary for the Fed to provide targeted capital relief. I wonder if you've thought any further about how the Fed can address this issue in an expeditious manner, and do you believe SACR can be implemented within the next eight to 12 months? I understand that there's uh, not even a proposal out, out for comment yet, but we have an issue in the options markets right now. So we, we think SACR is good policy, <clears throat> and we are, uh, we're working on a, on a rule on it now, and I hope it can get out before eight or 12 months. I'll go back to the office and, and check in, but I, it, it's a priority. I know there's actual drafting going on and negotiation between agencies, so it'll That's happen. Great. That's perfect. Uh, that's what we want to hear. And, and again, it, I think you can see from even just the action uh, <clears throat> yesterday and in the last couple of weeks of uh, very strong bipartisan support uh, to make sure that uh, these markets work well. Um, I sent a letter to financial regulators with responsibility for the Volcker rule back um, just a couple weeks ago, July 6th, requesting that they reconsider the definition of covered funds. Uh, that definition currently excludes venture capital. As my letter states, the congressional record clearly demonstrates through a colloquy between Senator Boxer and then Chairman Franks that investing in venture capital was never intended to be prohibited by the Volcker Rule when Section 619 was drafted by Congress. This prohibition restricts access to capital for startup companies. I wonder, do you believe the Volcker Rule should be amended in a way that ends this prohibition on investment in venture capital? And have you discussed this issue with your peers at the other financial regulators? And any thoughts on odds uh, that, this, uh, that there could be change made here? I'm, I'm not directly handling those discussions now, but uh, you know we we've put a, a we put a draft out for comment, and uh, we're hearing on this point a lot, I believe. And um, uh, 
you know, although I guess the comment period, the comments haven't really come in yet, but in fact the comment period hasn't started running yet because we haven't published the, the notice. But um, our idea is that uh, these activities are not ones generally that threaten safety and soundness. So consistent with the, with the letter and intent of the law, we want to allow what flexibility there is and, and you know, we look forward to getting input on how we can do that. Great, thanks. I recently uh, sent uh, you, your office a letter that I hope uh, will draw your attention to the growing issue of wire fraud. Um, this is something that we've heard testimony on in the Financial Services Committee last year. In general, uh, since reviewing my letter, I wonder if you have any ideas for how to prevent wire fraud, and have you considered uh, any recommendations, maybe some that I'd made of having financial institutions apply a payee matching system when initiating a wire transfer? So we appreciate your letter. Uh, I was looking at it again this morning, as a matter of fact, and we're, we're, we're putting together a nice response. Some of the, the data in your letter is quite alarming, so we appreciate your bringing that to our attention. Great. Um, so we're, we'll come back to you Perfect. with something in detail on that. That's great. Thank you so much. And if there's anything else you need from us or that we can be helpful again, I think it is something that's so important for that confidence, especially in home purchases and things uh, that is uh, um, being abused right now. Last question, the last minute here, and, and a lot of my colleagues on both sides have talked about this, but over the last 18 months, by almost every measure, we have had a very strong economy and taken appropriate actions to allow this momentum to continue. We've seen boost in consumer and business confidence uh, following the recent tax cuts and continued regulatory relief efforts. That said, there are certainly issues that Congress must continue to address, like better training of our labor forces to meet labor demands of our expanding modern economy. I wonder, do you have concerns that uh, protectionist trade measures may generate headwinds that counteract the recent stimulus provided by Congress and the administration? Uh, and do you believe a trade deficit is uh, somehow a measure of whether the U.S. is winning or losing in the global economy? In other words, do you believe trade is a zero-sum game? Um, we, we have these discussions going on with basically all of our major trading partners, NAFTA, the EU, China. and. Um, we're not responsible for those. We're not even a participant. We're not consulted in any way. Um, but, uh, you know, we, it would be good if they resulted in lower tariffs broadly. If they result in higher tariffs, higher trade barriers, then that'll be a bad thing for our economy, for our workers, and for incomes. Thanks, Chair. I yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. The Chair wishes to inform all members that uh, I will be excusing the witness at 1.30. I anticipate clearing four more members. Currently in the queue is Mr. Gottheimer, Mr. Laddermilk, Mr. Davidson, and Mr. Budd. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, thank you for being here today. Our economy, as you know, is entering a phase of increasing technological disruption, including automation through artificial intelligence. These factors are ex expected to eventually increase our productivity but also to significantly affect our workplace. McKinsey recently issued a report on automation and jobs that projects 16 million to 54 million Americans will have to find new occupations by 2030, depending on how quickly technolo technology is adopted. Uh, if you take the taxi industry as an example, the use of ride-sharing apps have devalued assets like taxi medallions and transformed that industry. It's pushed some drivers out and brought new entrants in. And as tech companies strive for more automation and leverage artificial intelligence, more drivers will likely be pushed out or transitioned. AI and automation will have the same effect on other spaces like trucking and trading and a host of other industries. And I believe in tech and I obviously don't believe we should become Luddites. We need to look toward the future and constantly innovate. It's a big competitive advantage for our country and obviously our foreign competitors are doing the same. Uh, I believe our government needs fiscal and monetary policy to ease the transition or at least be aware of it and understand what we need to to in this, in this process, and the Fed's monetary policy is obviously a blunt tool, but given your dual mandate, are you monitoring automation's impact on productivity and our labor, and, and what tools are you considering in this transition, sir? So we, we look very carefully at those issues. We have great research, or researchers at the Fed. We don't have a lot of tools to, to deal with it, but they do present uh, you know, really challenging uh, issues for us in the future and now. Are there things that you believe that Congress should be considering to help minimize the effects of these transitions or make sure we're prepared for, as a workforce? Well, I, I think, um, you know, when I graduated from college, I think there was this sense that people would find a career and find an employer, and they, many, 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 many of them would spend 30 years at that employer. I think that's, that's not the world we're in so much anymore, not that some people won't do that. So I, I really think this, the idea that education ends when you get out of college or grad school, we need to be thinking a lot about mid-career 
training and education so people can go on and have another leg to their careers rather than you know, being kind of let out to pasture at age 40. So I, th I think that's a key thing we need to be doing, and Congress can certainly play a role there. Thank you, sir. And just to switch topics slightly, and I appreciate your response there. On, on the housing front, I want to speak to you about the market a bit, specifically the change we've seen in the Federal Housing Administration's insured loans, but also the market as a whole. The mortgage market is now dominated by non-bank lenders. They're upwards of 75% of FHA loans. Prior to the housing crisis in that frothy area, this number was flipped on its head. Banks made up more than 75%, if not more, of the housing market. What risk do you think this presents as the cycle, as the credit cycle turns? That's my first question, if you don't mind. So in, um, in housing now, um, we do see um, that, that most of the borrowers now have much higher credit scores. So it's a very different market. Uh, and the question is, was that line drawn at the right place? But it's, it's clear that most of the people who have access to mortgage credit now are people with fairly high credit scores. So it's, it is quite different. And that's where, the, that's where the household borrowing is, is again, from those who are so well you think if there's, a down, if there's a downturn, we're better prepared for it? We're better prepared for it, yes. Uh, are there things that you think, as you look at this, that Congress should be doing to get banks back into the mortgage market more to, in, to ensure lending during economic downturns, you know, looking forward there? Well, I, th I think a good question for Congress is, and this is not one for us but for you, is, you know, coming out of the crisis, we, the one place where we really changed credit availability was in mortgages, and that, that had to be done, right? So because we know that mortgage credit was people were, were making loans that they may not have understood but that really shouldn't have been made, lots and lots of those. So, I mean, the question is, was that made at the right level? Are there still at the margin, and there's been some work done on this, there, there are probably significant numbers of creditworthy borrowers who are not getting access to mortgage credit. And, and I would think, you know, part of it is that the banks know that they made these terrible mistakes and paid big prices for it, and so do the households. Still, I think it's worth looking at that. It's not too soon to be looking at that. I think you're right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your time. Thank you. <clears throat> the gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes now the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, thank you for uh, spending the time with us today. I actually want to circle back to something that Chairman Lukemeyer uh, raised earlier today, and since that was uh, probably a couple of hours ago, uh, refresh. Uh, he was talking about the banks that fall between the $100 and $250 billion uh, in assets and how after the 18-month period they are relieved from SIFI regulation. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, after that, the law allows the Fed the ability to restore the regulations if the bank shows to be uh, a systemic risk. But regarding current conditions, recent CCAR results and GSIB's surcharge risk data show that banks with less than $250 billion do not present a systemic risk at this time. And I, as well as many others, believe that there should be uh, exemption from the SIFI regulation for those. So we'll follow up that, that when you testified um, back in February, um, I had asked similar questions, and uh, you had said that banks under $250 billion are more engaged in traditional banking and less complex and generally do not pose a systemic risk to the economy. So my first question is, am I correct in assuming that since the CCAR results further confirm your view that these firms don't pose a systemic risk at this time? You know, it's interesting. As a general matter, yeah, actually one of the eight SIFIs has less than $250 billion in assets and is still a SIFI. One, one of them does because of its, the nature of its activity. So we look at a range of things. I would stand by what I said, though. With it, under 250, these are institutions which generally are they're simpler, they're less complex, um, and they're engaged in traditional banking activities. So they're different from the very large ones that, that uh, deserve and get the higher scrutiny. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. And at yesterday's hearing, you discussed a thorough rulemaking process that um, you're going to make sure that the, the, these firms are strictly reviewed before receiving regulatory relief. On that topic, some bankers who I've spoken with um, are concerned that your staff wants to tailor the regulations or particularly or partially apply them to firms that are not systemically risky. If this is true, and which would be uh, somewhat troubling, I think data and evidence should be the, determine the outcome. Can you confirm that firms that don't pose a systemic risk will be exempt from the SIFI regulations? You know, we're, we're going to do exactly what the bill 
orders us to do, which is publish a framework for how we're going to think about risk to, to financial stability and safety and soundness. This is the language of the bill. We're going to put that out as soon as we can possibly get it thought through. We're going to, we're going to get comment on it, and then we're going to go forward from there. And, uh, you know, we, we very much take to heart the letter and spirit of the bill, and, uh, you know, we'll look forward to getting input when we finally propose something, I, I, I hope soon. So am I right to interpret that we're going to let the data determine the outcome? We're gonna, so we, yeah, we're, gonna, we're, ident we're in the process now of identifying the factors that we'll think about. The bill gives us a lot of flexibility, identifies some factors and gives us other flexibility. We're going to publish a framework that says how we're going to look at activities and institutions below 250, and then we're going to hear back from the world about how we did and how we should think about these things. And it's a process that the statute orders us to undertake, and that's what we're doing. So is it is it conceivable that, or maybe it isn't, is, is it, I guess, possible that you have a, a regional bank, let's say $150 billion or so, that may have partial regulation of SIFI, or is it going to be a, either they're, they're systemically risky or not? Really haven't, really haven't faced that question yet. We, we've always tailored, even, even when, the, when the limit was 50, we always tailored the application of the, of the so-called enhanced prudential standards under 165. We tailored those a lot in the prior world, so we'll obviously do that too, and we'll, we'll certainly do that, continue to do that. Okay, and uh, probably don't have time to get into my last question, so I'll submit it to the record, and I'll yield back the rest of my time to maybe allow somebody else get in before the hard time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson. Thank you, Chairman, and Chairman, thanks for your testimony. Thanks for the work you're doing there, and uh, look forward to the Senate giving you some more colleagues soon, hopefully. Um, you've spoken a fair bit about trade. A lot of our colleagues are concerned about trade and the impact um, that bad trade practices have had uh, on our economy, and frankly, uh, some concerned about the tactics that, uh, that have been employed to engage in that. I, I wanted to uh, see if I got your quote right. Trade is really the business of Congress, and Congress has delegated some of that to the executive branch. Um, do you think it would be a positive development from the economy's perspective to have uh, collaboration across the entire cross-section of the economy that Congress represents? I think, you know, this is really Congress's, the Constitution gives this to you. Authority. And you've, over time, delegated some of it to the executive branch, but it's your authority. Thank you, and we're working to reclaim it with the Global Trade Accountability Act, H.R. 5281, always looking for co-sponsors, and, uh, and this leaves the authority in the President's uh, hands to negotiate, but similar to the RAINS Act, gives authority to Congress to review, and I think it would promote uh, a more collaborative process uh, than Peter Navarro has recommended and, in fact, uh, persuaded folks to implement. Um, do you think that if we had practices that were more targeted uh, in, in the effect that we could be uh, able to focus on bad things, then uh, do you, well, let's just phrase it the other way. Do you think uniform action across all countries and all sectors uh, is potentially more disruptive to the uh, economy than targeted actions? You know, I, um, as, as you know, Mr. Davidson, I, we, we don't have this authority. This is authority that... Uh, Correct. I'm, I'm just asking about the impact on the economy, yeah. macroeconomic issues like fiscal policy, trade policy, immigration policy that can affect the economy. I think we have a role there because, you know, we're responsible for the economy, but I think we need to stay at a higher level of principle. And, and you know, and what, what I'm comfortable saying is that a more protection, a protectionist approach to trade, if it's sustained over a period of time, you know, it has not historically been good for economies. It's meant lower incomes. It's, you know, less opportunity for workers. On the economic principle of trade, it's called trade because uh, it's reciprocal uh, in the sense both, both parties benefit uh, in trade. Do you see trade as a zero-sum game? No, I do think that trade needs to be fair as well as free, and I think it's very appropriate to have an internet internationally agreed set of rules, and when anybody breaks those rules, they have to face the other countries in that setting and change their policies. I think, I think that's, a, that's a healthy way to go. I, I, I don't think a bilateral trade deficit is, is a good measure of trade between countries, though. Thank you very much. One of the things we've also dwelled on is workforce participation, and one of the big barriers to the growth rate in the economy is workforce participation. Uh, without you know, alluding to specific policy, and I don't want to put you in that spot, we've tried to make some reforms on bills, most notably recently the Farm Bill, which is really only about 20% about farming. Uh, 
uh, a very incremental change to expect that working age adults, um, 18 to 59, uh, able-bodied, no dependent kids at home, not an economically depressed area, a couple other qualifiers, that in order to continue to receive uh, support through food stamps that they would work. Would this, in your mind, policy tools that motivate people to participate uh, be effective at workforce participation? And, and as you know, I can't, I can't really take a position on that. I will say that there, there's not a lot that you could do that would be more constructive than find ways to support labor force participation that, are, that, are bipart that will work on a bipartisan basis and can be enacted. It's Thank you for that. Important. Thank you. And so cryptocurrency is a, is a big thing. And so without talking about uh, you know, specific things uh, in our policy, we are working with uh, Basel on a number of fronts. And um, some concern, we always protect our sovereignty in that. Where do you see uh, Basel going with respect to cryptocurrency? Because essentially the concern there is that even if the U.S. creates a better regulatory framework than we have today, um, there's still arbitrage in markets. Uh, so there's a desire to have some regulatory framework. Is Basel addressing that, particularly with respect to cryptocurrency? I think, um, you know, anybody who owns, if a bank owns cryptocurrency, then it'll be subject to to capital, so it'll have to hold capital against that. I guess a good question is, how should it be more than the normal level of capital? Because it's a risky asset. Right, so to the extent that it's an asset, uh, it would be treated, if it's a commodity, treated as if it's a commodity. If it's truly a currency, it would be treated as a currency based on its amount of volatility as a currency. For example, a pound sterling is probably a different reserve currency than the Thai bot. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know that we, so it's, it's not mainly a bank capital issue. Of course, I think the regulatory issues facing uh, cryptocurrencies are, are big and broad and go way beyond banking. And, uh, Thank you. My time has expired. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair will recognize one more member, and then we will dismiss the witness and adjourn. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd. Thank you, Chairman Hinchling and Chairman Powell again. Welcome back. It's always good to be with you. We appreciate you being here today. So I want to start off with Volcker. I think a lot of us can at least appreciate the intent behind Volcker, uh, which is to reduce risky activities in banks, in particular high-risk prop trading, and that potentially makes sense. However, it seems to be odd results that under the current rule, activities such as providing capital and loans to growth and startup companies, activities that we should be encouraging uh, banks to engage in are, are materially limited as a result of that rule. Your recent NPR is open-ended on covered funds and does not provide a lot of guidance about the, where the Fed may intend to go. Yet these funds can be critical sources of capital for companies looking to grow their businesses. And the prohibition on funds is fairly broad and even includes Restrictions on venture capital funds. So, Chairman Powell, is there a way for the Fed to simplify the covered funds regime to help smaller companies obtain greater access to capital? And, and uh, we're, we're looking for ways to simplify Volcker in ways that are faithful to the language and intent of the statute, and that, that's one particular provision. And, you know, we look forward to, uh, to getting constructive comments on how we may do that better. So you're just waiting through the NPR period then on that? Yeah, we're... we're we're really looking for input here on where, you know, this is a, this is a notice of proposed rulemaking. We want a lot of input. We, we do, we, you know, our job is to implement Congress's wish, and that is the Volcker rule, but we feel like there's, we want to use such flexibility as we have that doesn't undermine safety and soundness, and that there would clearly be some flexibility around the issue you're talking about. Thank you. I want to switch topics uh, to the ongoing negotiation of a new International Capital Standards, or ICS. First, I want to thank you for such a quick and thorough response to questions that I had after we met last time. We don't always get quick responses, but you did, so thank you. We're genuinely, genuinely grateful. Um, and the following question, sir, it was originally intended for Vice Chairman Quarles, but a letter he sent back to my office on this question we received just, just yesterday and um, chose not to respond to this portion. So hopefully I'll, I'll pitch it to you for an answer. And uh, Governor Daniel Torillo stated in a speech at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners International Insurance Forum, this is on May 20th of 16, he said, quote, there are, as you all know, a lot of ideas out there as to how we should construct the capital requirements we will apply to insurance companies. Some, such as variations on the Solvency II approach used in the European Union, strike us as unpromising. Evaluation frameworks for insurance liabilities adopted in Solvency II differ starkly from U.S. GAAP and may introduce excessive volatility. Such an approach would also be inconsistent with our preferred or strong preference for building a predominantly standardized risk-based capital rule that enables comparisons across firms without excessive reliance on internal models. 
Finally, this is a mouthful, isn't it? Finally, it appears that solvency too could be quite pro-cyclical. So do you agree with what Governor Trillo said there? It, it makes sense to me, I have to admit. I, I, I don't recall that speech and what issue he was talking about there. About solvency, solvency too being used by the EU, being pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. You know, I, I'd want to check with our insurance capital experts, but yes, what, I, I, I do believe that, uh, that, that, thing, that reflects our view. Good. Can you give us any explanation as to why the Federal Reserve staff participating in the Kuala Lumpur negotiations agreed to accede to the Europeans at the IAIS to mandate that the financial reporting for the reference ICS be done using a solvency two approach? It's what we just talked about, solvency two approach, and not something more suitable for the U.S. insurance industry like GAAP or statutory accounting. Yeah, I, I'll have to check up on this. I, I don't have this kind of detail. Pretty in the weeds, but appreciate you it thinking is. through it. Right. And if we could, could get that back, thank you. Um, and finally, uh, do you agree with Governor Torillo that a solvency two accounting approach introduces excessive volatility into the U.S. insurance markets? And if so, how do you plan on remedying this at the next IAIS negotiations? On I see. I'm really going to have to go to the office on this one. <laughs> we just <laughs> delve further into these weeds. Well, if we We're could get it. a response, it would be great uh, at another time. We'll so yeah, we'll thank you so much again for your time. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, yields back. I'd like to thank Chairman Powell for his testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witness to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for his response. I would ask Chairman Powell that you respond as promptly as you are.